that we are thankful that salvation is through Christ alone. And may we be prepared for this ordinance you've given us to celebrate. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. If you're new to the Adventist Church, we, we celebrate communion once every quarter. So today, and you're going to say, well, who, who picks what Sabbath in the quarter? Guess who? I, I got to pull out my pastor's card on that one. I, I choose that one. But today, I chose that we'd have communion. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have your Bible, if not, there might, and there should be one in front of you. You might also have it maybe on a device. If you do have a, your Bible on a device, I just ask you if you would please turn it to silent. So therefore, it will not disturb others. So when you get to 1 Corinthians, you can just say, Amen. And as I like to do is, I always like to say that if you have a hard time finding 1 Corinthians, is before 2 Corinthians, right? That's how you find it quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Say amen when you get there. And we're going to begin reading in verse 23. 1 Corinthians, which chapter? What verse? Who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians? Paul. And he says to the church there, For I received from whom? From the Lord. That which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. So what night was that? What do we call that? We call that Thursday, okay? So on Thursday night, okay, Christ sat down with his disciples and had the last Passover. And he's about to reveal, of course, this transition from the old to the new, okay? The old was all the types that were pointing to him. Can you say amen? Who is the Passover lamb? Christ is, right? Who are all those feasts and festivals and things that they did? Who do they point to? Jesus and his ministry, that's why Paul says in Colossians that those feast festivals and those things there were nailed to the cross. They were shadows. Uh, it's not talking about the law there. It's talking about all the feasts and festivals anyway. Now we're in verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for who? You can't say here, it was broken for me. Can you not say that? can't say that, okay. because that's who you is, right? So let's read that verse and say me, because that's exactly what it means there. Verse 24 says, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for, for me. That's right. That, and for you, do this in remembrance of me, verse 25, in the same manner, he also took up the cup, also su- uh, took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, verse 26. Here it is. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, that's what we call what? Communion. You proclaim the Lord's death. What's the next three words? Till he comes. That's the title of our sermon. Till he what? Comes. Communion is an ordinance that is to be kept by God's people until he returns. Yes or no? As we hold communion, we hold Jesus' promise that he will come again. He even affirms his coming during the Lord's Supper. Go to Matthew. We usually like to read and quote many other verses, which of course are there, to try to show that Christ has promised to return, but we usually don't take them to this one, that even in the Lord's Supper there, Christ here will say that he's going to return, that he even affirms his second coming in the Lord's Supper there in Matthew 26. Say amen if you're there. Matthew 26. Look at verse 29. 
Are you there? And Jesus says here, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, here it is, until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Can you read between the lines there, yes or no? That for us to one day partake of this with him in his Father's kingdom, what must he do? He must what? Must come back. Here Jesus introducing this new ordinance that replaces the old Passover and all fits in there that as we partake in communion, and we're going to see in foot washing, it is something that God's people, when they do, will always keep fresh in their minds that Jesus is coming. Because in the Lord's Supper, he promised even then he would. So every time we partake in communion, we are keeping in our remembrance and anticipation the promise and reality of Christ's return. Is that not what Paul told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Yes or no? Yes. Do this that will remember his death until he comes. And Christ affirms this, of course, there, as we see in Matthew chapter 26. Communion constantly, what's the word? Constantly reminds us that this world is not our home. Every time we partake in communion, it is to keep it fresh in our minds that this world is not our home. We long to be one day in the kingdom that God has prepared for us and will return to get us from and do away with all this mess of sin and suffering. Can you say amen? So if these last months and weeks that you begin to sort of wane in your understanding of where we are, this world, sin, suffering, and Christ return today, as we partake in this order, we say, oh, yes, Lord, let me, let me gauge myself again. Thank you, Lord. This world is not my home. I long for my Savior to come, and this will remind me of his promise. But there's something more. There's something what? If you study the Bible correctly, you're going to see that foot washing and communion are inseparable. What are they? For in the Bible, communion and foot washing are inseparably linked. You see, Jesus tried to get his disciples to understand his mission of humility, service, and sacrifice. What are, what, are, what are those three words? All right, I heard. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's try it again. What was it? Humility. That's better. As well, of course, as his death on the cross. And let's go to Matthew chapter 20, and let's take a look at that. You're in Matthew 26, go a few pages to the left, come to Matthew chapter 20, and this is our scripture reading. And this is what Christ is trying to get across from them, that this is what his kingdom is all about. It's all about humility, service, and sacrifice. Thank you, Dia. Are you there? And just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We have here humility, we have here service, and we have here sacrifice. Yes or no? Yes. But the carnal heart doesn't like to hear that. And in the context here of this verse by Jesus, go to verse 20. We don't have time to go at all because I know it's communion and you guys are expecting a short sermon. Just say yes, I know you are. Are you in verse 20? Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, who are 
Who are the Zebedee's sons? What's their names? Who knows? James and John came to him, capital H, with her sons, James and John, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your what? Kingdom. Okay, now don't forget that Jesus said that he will say that in, my, in the Lord's Supper that I will not drink this of, uh, uh, with you until my Father's kingdom. So before we get there, his disciples obviously are still not understanding that God's kingdom is about, what's the three, Hugh? And, and, and of course James and John says, well, let, let's get mom to ask Jesus. Because when he sets up his earthly kingdom, we want to be on his right and left, right? They were not thinking humility, service, and sacrifice. They were thinking what? Exaltation and and pride and power. Yes or no? Now verse 22, and it says, But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask, for you are you able to drink what? The... So here in these passages, we have the word kingdom, we have the word cup. In the Lord's Supper, he takes up a cup to express to them really what cup here we're talking about and what kingdom he's referring to. Are you understanding? Then he says, are you able to drink the the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, oh, we are able. You see, the disciples didn't get it, and one, listen now, and one of the last things Jesus does on this earth before he dies for our sins is show what he had said so many times, and especially here, what it's all about. And before he partakes in that cup, and understands what it's about, he will do a service before the Lord's Supper, we're going to see, that will highlight what they're just not understanding, and that is humility, service, and sacrifice, that every time God's people would partake in that service, they would always remember what it's all about. Are you understanding? In the book Desire of Ages, page 642, We're told here the whole life of Christ had been a life of unselfish, what's the word? Service. And then she quotes Matthew 20, 28, which says again, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. She quotes that. Had been the lesson of his every act. But not yet had the disciples learned the lesson. Do we sometimes have a hard time learning lessons? And what God does is at this last Passover supper, Jesus repeated his teaching by a what? By an illustration that impressed it forever on their minds and hearts. Foot washing cannot be separated from communion. Let's go to John 13. Let's read it. Now, we're just going to read here. Okay, we're not going to be able to dissect everything here. Let's just read. Let's put ourselves there when Jesus begins to wash his disciples' feet. We're just going to read it and just allow the Holy Spirit to to impress our hearts and minds of the beauty of this. Okay, we're just going to read the verses. We're in John chapter 13. And say amen when you get there. It's not even 1130 yet. Uh, John 13, are we there? Now remember I said that Paul and Jesus, Jesus, Paul, of course, helped us understand that communion and even will always keep in mind that Christ will return, yes or no? And the foot washing illustration, though, listen now, will always help us understand what God's kingdom is all about before he returns to take us there. Are you in John 13? It says, 
Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world, to whom? To the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And now I have the New King James. It says this in verse 2, and supper being ended. That is not the best translation there, okay? Uh, even in my, it says here, even in my little notes, it says, and during supper. In other words, it's not when everything was over that he begins to wash it. No, that's not. It's saying that as they began, as they, they sat down, everything there, they were getting ready. And right before Christ Right before they began to do the bread and the, and, the, and the cup thing, Jesus is looking around to say, wait a second now, and he does something that will set the stage for communion. And let's see what he does. The devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. He rose, verse 4, rose from the supper and laid aside his what? His garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he girded. You do know that to wash the feet and to wipe it with what he girded with, Christ would have to have uh, knelt there before them, the king of the universe, the creator of heavens and earth, and wash their feet and wipe them, wipe them, wipe them with the towel he girded with. And then I'm sure he would move on to the others. This is Jesus. And who is one of the 12 that he's going to wash the feet of? Judas. Let's keep reading. Verse 6, then he came to whom? Simon Peter, and Peter said, Lord, Lord, what are you doing? Right? You're washing my feet? This was done by, uh, uh, by workers and slaves. This was their job, and Christ was doing something that was beneath them to do. Desire of Ages points out that when Judas saw Jesus wipe to the feet of the disciples, he said, this can't be the, the, the Messiah. This can't be the Messiah we're waiting for here. This can't be him. That's what she said. When Judas saw that, he didn't get, didn't, he didn't, right then, he settles it that I'm going to go do right what the, the devil had put in his heart. But this is what the Messiah is all about. We're now in verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 7. And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Verse 8, Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Because again, God's kingdom is all about? And out of God's love, an understanding of the human heart, he says, I'm going to give them an illustration that will impress it forever in their minds what my kingdom is all about. And now we come to what verse? What verse are we on here? Verse uh, 9, and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Verse 12, and when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, and may you open your heart to Jesus speaking to you and to me. Who here is a disciple of Jesus? Then this is to us. Yes or no? 
Yes. Jesus says, do you know what I have done to you? Verse 13, you call me teacher, capital T, and Lord, capital L, and, and you say, well, for so I am. If I am your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. Now, you might not like what he's going to say. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you what? An example that you should do as I have done to you. Foot washing and communion are inseparable. They're connected. Verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who was sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. When my wife and I got married, July 24, 2011, can never get that wrong, right? My wife is here, she's watching me. We did in our, what we did in our wedding is we washed each other's feet. And then our friends who got married later did that too. I think they copied us. And what that symbolized was that I'm not greater than you and you're not greater than me and we are here by God's grace to serve, to be a sacrifice. Sometimes when you're married, it's a sacrifice. Men, can you say amen? And to be humble. What kind of a marriage will you have if you're both humble, there to serve, and to sacrifice? One amen. Thank you, Jared. That was the symbol. But this is the ultimate symbol of God's people to say, we're all sinners. We're all in the same boat here. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We all need Jesus. And may we always remember that we need to be humble, serve, and sacrifice. You guys with me? We're almost done here. Desire of Ages, page 649. No one one was so exalted as whom? As Christ. And yet he stooped to the humblest duty that his people might not be misled by the selfishness which dwells in the natural heart and which strengthens by self-serving. Christ himself set the example of humility. He would not leave his great subject in man's charge. Of so much consequence he did regard it that he himself, one equal with God, acted as servant to his disciples while they were contending for the highest place, he to whom every knee shall bow, he whom the angels of glory counted in honor to serve, bowed down to wash the feet of those who called him Lord. He washed the feet of his betrayer. And just a few more here in page 650. Christ was here instituting a religious service. By the act of our Lord, this humiliating ceremony was made a consecrated what? What kind of ordinance is it? It was to be observed by the disciples that they might ever keep in mind his lessons of humility and service. One more, this ordinance is Christ's appointed preparation for the sacramental service. It's the what? Preparation. They're they're linked, again I said. While pride, variance, and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. We are not prepared to receive the communion of his body and his blood. Therefore, 
It was that Jesus appointed the memorial of his humiliation to be what? First observed. Because then when we do, our hearts are ready to partake in his sacrifice and his example. Last verses here, back to 1 Corinthians 11, and they will partake. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's see who can beat me there. Oh. All right. You got me this time. But it's not a race. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, say amen if you're there. We just read verses 23 through 26 when we first started the service. Yes or no? Or the message, yes? Yes. Go to verse 27. Verse 27 says, For I received... Sorry, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord, talking about communion, what he just talked about, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of whom? The Lord. Look at verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now look at verse 33. Therefore, my brethren... When you come together to eat, talking about um, communion, the context, wait for what? Now look what he says. But if anyone is hungry, what does he say? Let him go home, just stay with me, lest you come together for judgment and, I, and, and the rest I will set in order when I come. And he says this, when, when we come together for communion, this is not lunchtime and snack time. If you're hungry, go home and eat. This isn't snack time and lunch here, friends. This is a sacred ordinance that reminds us of the broken body of our Savior and his blood shed for us. This is not snack time. Amen. So my friends, This is a time to appreciate and rejoice in God's sacrifice and love for us and a searching of our selfish hearts. That the Lord wants us to be ready for his second coming and understand what his kingdom is about before we get there physically. And it's all about, starts with an H, Humility. And what ordinance did he give us to help us keep that in view? And then as we search our hearts, we come to partake in 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 an ordinance that celebrates his death for us. And therefore we claim his promise that Jesus is returning. So my friends, here... In our church, we like to follow the example of Jesus. And what we do is before we partake in communion, we partake in foot washing. Now, you are not required to do that. You can say amen, right? Uh, no one is forced here to do anything. God is a spouse about freedom. Can you say amen, right? We, we appeal to you to, to partake in foot washing, to learn, but you are not required to do that. If you've never partook in foot washing before, I want to encourage you to follow the example of your Savior. Maybe you just would like to see. I've never seen foot washing. Let me just take a look and how it works. You're more than welcome to go to any station. Just take a look. If you choose just to stay and sit down here until we're done and come back for communion, you are more than willing to do that as well, right? Three options is you can partake in foot washing and receive that blessing. You can go and take a look if you've never seen it before, or you can just sit here and wait till communion. Does that make sense? Okay, three options, okay. We'll then come back, and you might see some flowers on the, the pews there. I, if you can, let's sit on the pews with flowers. That will give the deacons room to give out the bread 
and the Jews. Does that make sense? Okay, very good. So I'm going to have a prayer, and we're going to be dismissed, but I want to encourage you, please, to have the privilege and the honor to wash the feet of a fellow brother and sister in Jesus. I didn't, have a, I didn't do my nails, and I didn't wash my feet. Who cares? Okay. I encourage you to do that, but again, you're not have to, but I encourage you to do it. So the men will be here. These two rooms to your, your left. The ladies will be in the youth room, which is in a room right down over here. If you are married and desire to wash the feet of your spouse, then we have a couple's room down in the junior room. I'm going to say it again. Men are over here. The ladies are in the youth room. And if you want to wash your spouse's feet, you're in the uh, junior room. You guys with me? Okay. Father God, thank you so much for being with us, Lord, today. And Lord, I thank you for this moment that we have here as we come and understand the beauty of foot washing and communion, I thank you for your people, Lord. And Lord, may we learn the lesson that your kingdom is about humility, it's about service, it's about sacrifice. It's not about me. It's about you, Lord. Thank you for these ordinances that you've given us that we look at every so often, Lord, to keep that in our memory. And again, to keep that promise that you've made that we shall do this till you come. We thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for being this kind of a God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.